Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Providence Presbyterian Church here on Hilton Head Island. We're glad you're here today. Um, if this is your first time here, we especially welcome you and those joining us online. Um, we're sorry about last week, kind of a lot of glitches, but we got the Wi-Fi back working, so we're glad we're all, all together online and in person this morning. Over on the table to your right, my left, uh, we have water, or we have lemonade and coffee, so if you need anything to drink during the service, especially maybe some cold lemonade, feel free to get up and get that. And there's, I was going to, yes, there are muffins there as well, so we hope you'll um, have a muffin. And there's also bulletins and an offering plate. So you're welcome to um, contribute to the Ministry of Mission of Providence as you leave as well. Um, in your bulletin, um, there are several announcements. You'll see that. I just want to encourage you to read through those about the Thornwell trip and the um, Christmas at the Biltmore, um, other exciting things going on in the life of Providence. Um, I did want to mention we are planning a new members class coming up at the beginning of September. And it's a little different this time. We're offering two options. Um, there's one that's going to be on a Wednesday evening, September 6th, um, kind of a one-time shot with, with a light supper. And then the option two um, would be on Sunday mornings um, for two consecutive weeks during Sunday school. You can read about that. If you've been thinking about joining Providence or you just want to know more information about um, Presbyterian, Presbyterianism and, and Providence, we encourage you to attend one of those. On the Connect card, um, which is the um, perforated um, piece of paper you can tear off, um, you could check which class you might be thinking of coming to and give us your name. Also, um, the Connect card is useful for updating any email addresses. We send out an a, um, emailer every week, rather lengthy sometimes, with all the things that are happening, and then prayer requests. And those prayer requests uh, we do take seriously, so they are prayed over. So we encourage you to tear that off and put that in the offering plate as you leave as well. Our opening song is Lord Lift, We Lift Your Name on High, and if you are able, please stand. to invite uh, Pete Burbano forward. He is going to give our minute for mission. Uh, we welcome him this morning. He's part of the ministry team um, for Ministry of Hope, which you've heard us talk about before. Um, he's going to share with you what they're up to, and we are glad you're here, Pete. Thank you. Morning, church. September 2011, while well, I was a member of Providence. Is this on? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear it now. Well, I was a member of Providence. We started a feeding program um, through the, uh, for the village of Chimwangabee, where we uh, targeted 600 children 
giving them five meals a week, you know, for about 20 weeks. Um, and it has progressed so far that, you know, now 600 children has turned into 6,000. I'm sorry, I get emotional <laughs> talking about these children right now, but the past few years have been a challenge. The prices of, you know, back in 2011, we were feeding these children for about 10 cents a child a day. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, this year, it's estimated to be about 16 cents a day. And now 6,000 children. But like I say, not only these children getting fed, you know, they're getting the word of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> Kids are doing better in school. More kids are going to school. Um, and the big thing is they get the word of the Lord every day, and they know that the reason why they're being fed is the love that Jesus Christ has placed in our hearts for them. But um, going over again this year with Fran Hallam and her son John Hallam, um, <coughs> they'll be doing mobile medical clinics and purchases for the nursery for the 20-some-odd uh, babies that are in the nursery. Uh, to help them get through the next six to eight months, but also this feeding program. Um, we need your help. You know, um, like I say, it's, it's, it's close to 15 to 16 cents a child a day to feed these children. And if you do the math, 6,000 children for about 20 weeks, five to six meals a week, it's really going up there. So, you know, I, I need your help. Um, we need your help. Um, any gifts you can bring, there's inserts in your, in your uh, um, bulletin boards there today tell you what the mobile medical clinic needs, tells you what the children need at the crisis nursery, and also funding for this feeding program. So I'll be here afterwards. If anyone has any questions for me, I, I'd be glad to answer them for you. Um, but God bless your province. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Definitely a fabulous ministry that Providence has been a part of. Um, since the beginning, and we thank uh, Pete and, and Fran and um, her son for their um, efforts in going over there this year. And, and as Pete said in the bulletin, um, if you would like to help out, um, there are ways in which you can donate supplies or donate uh, financial resources as well. Um, I wanted to mention, I see some of you uh, fanning yourselves, uh, which is great. Um, and, uh, but we do have fans. I, I don't know if there's more out there. Oh, we ran out of fans. Man, I thought I had more fans than that. I guess not. So we'll have to get more fans. Okay. Um, let us continue in prayer. Dear gracious God, we do give thanks this morning. Um, and we, we pause for a few moments um, to come before you with our hearts filled with, with a mixture of emotions. We are grateful for the, the beauty of the world you have created, and yet we are also reminded so often of the fragility of life as we think about recent events like the devastating fires in Maui. We lift up in our prayers those who have been directly affected by this fire. We ask that your comfort surround them in these moments of loss and uncertainty. May your presence be a source of strength for those who have, who have lost their homes, who have lost their belongings. We extend our our gratitude this morning for the first responders, for firefighters, and, and all those who are working tirelessly. Grant them wisdom and courage and the protection they need as they carry out their duties. And in the midst of this tragedy, may we find unity as a community, reaching out to one another with kindness and support, helping those um, that are in need during this time through our prayers and our gifts. We also, Lord, once again ask for your presence to, to envelope the nation of Ukraine with comfort and peace, bring an end to conflict, guide leaders towards resolution, and grant strength to those enduring hardships. May your light shine upon Ukraine, fostering unity, healing, and hope this day. And as we hold just these two concerns in our hearts, we remember that there are countless other challenges and joys that fill our lives daily. We offer our prayers with trust and faith, knowing that you are present in every situation. And so we just pause for a few moments, lifting up our personal prayers in silence.
we lift up these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are in chapter 6 of Ephesians. We have spent all summer, and we're, we, we got our final installment next week. Um, but we are, we are getting there to the end. But we are at chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. A very famous passage from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, for whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Amen. Well, I was um, talking to a few of you right before the service, so let me, let me kind of right now tell you exactly what the temperature is. It's 84 degrees. It says the real feel is 103. I don't know if that's, does it feel like 103? It does, okay, okay. 106, okay. Uh, but, but I wanted to share with you, so that reminded me of this story about a, um, a, a very, very hot summer day. And only the pastor and one farmer arrived for their early outside service. Well, the pastor said, well, I guess we don't have to have a service today. And the farmer, a little agitated, replied, hey, if even one cow shows up at feeding time, I still feed it. Well, you're right, replied the pastor, and, and he proceeded to do the whole service just as planned. And at the end, he looked at the farmer and said, well, what do you think? And the farmer thought for a moment or two, and then he said, pastor, well, if it's 100 degrees and I go out to feed the cows and only one cow shows up, I feed it, but I don't feed him the whole load of hay. <laughs> so I know we have, we have a pretty good crowd this morning, um, but don't worry, I'm not going to give you the whole load of hay. I, I don't want anyone to pass out. So, so we're going to skip the intro and the conclusion. I'm going to get right to the heart of the matter of armoring up armoring up for God. Paul describes six items in that passage that comprise the battle armor. Six items to help us get through this life. Because, you know, you know this, it's not easy being a Christian in 2023. So we have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. So let's armor up together this morning. Verse 14 starts, Paul says, Stand firm then, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist. Let, let me just describe some of these pieces for you. A, a Roman sh soldier's belt was made of metal and thick heavy leather and was the carrying place for his sword. It also had a protective piece that, that hung down in the front and the belt held all the other pieces of the armor together. To be fitted with his belt meant he was ready for action. Paul says then it is the belt of truth. 
Truth is the belt that, that holds the believer's armor together as well. See, ultimate truth can be found in God's word and in the person of Jesus Christ. And we must know this truth. We must know that in order to protect ourselves against our flesh, against the world, and against the enemy, as Paul says, the devil. The spiritual forces of the world, Paul says. But, but also the call to buckle the belt of truth around your waist is a call to put away lying. It's, it, it's to speak the truth to one another. It's to confess our sins and not to cover, cover them up with falsehoods. It's not to slander, but to speak honest words about others. Paul wants those who are following Christ to be, to be a, a, a person of truth. That's the only way. That is the only way Christians are going to gain any credibility in this world. We tell the truth even when it's not easy, even when it means going against tremendous opposition. You know, the ninth commandment says, do not bear false witness. In other words, tell the truth. Jesus says that he is the truth. And in 1 Corinthians 13, another famous verse, Paul writes, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but love rejoices in truth. So that's the first. Put on the, the belt of truth. Secondly, Paul says to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The Roman soldier would have this fastened. Would, would have, after he put the belt on, he would have then fastened the breastplate around his chest. And there were two, two different type of breastplates. The first type worked by joining several curved metal bands together using leather throngs. The, the other was a type called chain mail, constructed by linking small metal rings together until they formed a vest. The purpose of, of both types of armor was the same. It was to protect the soldier's vital organs. If a soldier failed to wear his breastplate, an arrow could easily reach the soldier's chest, piercing his heart or his lungs. Well, Paul says, put on, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, when, when you think of the word righteous, what, 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 what do you think about? I guess the simple answer is it is doing what is right, what is fair, what is just. The prophets, for the prophets of the Old Testament, righteousness often means caring for the helpless in society. They specifically name the widow, the orphan, and the oppressed. I mean, we just talked about that with the lean season and the ministry of hope. In Isaiah 59, the Lord puts on righteousness as a breastplate, it says. And, and, and goes to battle against injustice and corruption, restoring peace and order to the land. The prophet Amos says, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Jesus said, The righteous are those who feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, and visit the lonely. So, so to put on the breastplate of righteousness means for us to stand firm against injustice and corruption in the world to take care of the weak and the vulnerable. Yeah, we also need to be mindful that, that when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, that as believers, we have no righteousness apart from that which has been given to us by Jesus Christ. Our, our breastplate is actually His righteousness. It is by His power we choose to do right. Living a right life, rooted in God's Word, is, is powerful in protecting our heart. So, so far we have a belt, we have a breastplate. What sort of footwear should we select? A pair of Nikes for speed, a pair of Stan Smith Adidas for versatility, a pair of rugged boots so that we can trek through the terrain, a pair of sandals so that we can bear the heat. Verse 15 says, Fit your feet with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You know, marching was an essential part of a soldier's life, and no soldier could march far without sturdy shoes. Even before the Roman era, the breaking of a soldier's shoe was a metaphor for weakness or defeat. Roman soldiers' feet were fitted with sandals called caliga. These sandals were, were made to help protect soldiers' feet during the long marches into battle. They, they had extremely thick soles and, and wrapped perfectly around the ankles in a way that protected against blistering. The Caliga also had spikes on the bottom to help them stand firm as they traveled. Without 
his shoes, a Roman soldier could not maintain a firm foundation, a firm position against his enemies. Well, Paul says uh, uh, believers also have a firm foundation in the gospel. As believers, we have peace in knowing we are secure in what Jesus has done for us. The gospel of peace is the good news that, that we can have peace with God. And that's the foundation of everything else. We are to bring that peace to others through the gospel. We, we, we are to use our shoes to go out and to share that peace, to share the good news with others. You know, when Jesus was born, the declaration by the angels was peace on earth, goodwill to all. When Jesus was on the Mount of Beatitudes overlooking the Sea of Galilee, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And, and, and you know, Jesus, they're not just talking about the absence of conflict. They're talking about the gospel of peace of sharing the, the good news of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote in, in Philippians, pursue what makes for peace. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, the peace of God, the secureness of, of God's love and mercy and salvation, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, so then we get to verse 16. In addition to all that, those the first three, Paul says to take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So, this was made from goat skin or, or calf skin, and it was stretched over sturdy pieces of wood. The Roman shield stood four feet tall and was three feet wide. That's a pretty big shield. Iron rims were, were fitted along the top and the bottom edges, and an iron circle was attached to the center of the shield. The boards kind of curved inward, and a leather strap was fastened to the back so you could hold it. Paul says, faith is the shield of the believer. You know, sometimes we, we speak of faith, we, we, we often focus on specific beliefs about God. But faith can also be understood as putting our trust in God. When we, when we hold up our shield of faith, our trust in God, it helps us deflect those things that seek to wound us or destroy us. Think about it. The, 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 the shield of faith is the Christian's protection against temptation, against doubt, against despair. Paul says in verse 12, this, it, it, it protects us, the shield protects us against the spiritual forces of evil, Paul says. Now, it's important to notice that the shield described by Paul was intended to be used in company with others. Sometimes we don't think about it this way. The, the Roman soldiers would actually work together using a formation known as the tortoise. And in the tortoise, rows of soldiers closed all gaps between one another, and they held their shields at the edges. So, so the first row of men placed their shields in front of them to protect the formation's front. Soldiers on the flanks held their shields to the side, and, and the troops in the middle balanced their shields on their helmets and overlapped them, protecting the formation from above. The formation protected the soldiers like a shell protects a tortoise. And as long as the soldiers remained together in this formation, they were nearly undefeatable. Well, like Roman soldiers in the tortoise formation, when Christians remain close to each other, they are stronger. For Paul, the Christian community is the tortoise formation for believers. We are strong as we seek to live out our faith together as a community of believers, as disciples in this world. All right, verse 17, Paul says, take the helmet of salvation. The Roman soldier's helmet was fashioned from, was made from bronze or iron. Two hinged cheek pieces protected the sides of the soldier's face. For the sake of comfort, many times they would line the helmets with sponge or felt. And of course, the, the helmet was intended to protect the skull and the neck from enemy weapons and from falling debris. Now, to put on the helmet of salvation 
is to first and foremost protect our head, especially our minds. You know, dark powers try to plant destructive ideas in our minds. I mean, you, you know, that there, there are countless of them. The Bible is not the ultimate truth. Sin is no big deal. People, are, are, people who are hurting are not your concern, or, or you're not good enough. Well, Paul says this helmet is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation points to, to God's ultimate victory over the forces of evil. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead provide all believers with, with freedom from the bondage of sin and with eternal life with God in heaven. Paul knows that, that Christians will have destructive ideas, destructive images in their minds, and they will face extremely dark days, collectively and, and personally. And in those times, the pure knowledge of our salvation will light the way, will give us hope, will carry us home. The final piece of armor Paul talks about is, is an offensive weapon. It's a sword. The sword of a Roman soldier was little more than, than two feet long. It was crafted from iron. Blacksmiths hardened the blade of the sword by covering the red-hot iron with coal dust. And, and the coal dust formed a hard carbon coating on the blade. Sword handles could be made from iron, by, from ivory, from bone, or from wood. And in battle, rows of Roman soldiers pressed back their enemies just kind of one step at a time by forcing their shields forward using their swords to advance. The blade was held flat and parallel to the ground. Now what's interesting about all this is that, that this is the only offensive weapon mentioned in Ephesians 6. The sword, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, were, were basically more or less defensive to protect against the enemy. The sword was designed though to defeat the enemy. Our passage says that we are to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And, and maybe not strike a death blow, but to strike a life blow to people. Paul says that a sword for the Christian is the word of God, both written and the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. And with, with God's word, we are truly able to withstand. We're able to defeat all enemies. Jesus actually used scripture to defeat Satan when he was tempted in the desert. We must do the same. Arm yourself. Be intentional about reading scripture. When, when, you, when you feel attacked or, or when you feel beaten down, immerse yourself in the word, in the Bible. I mean, even those with great faith are going to have days when they feel like they are barely hanging on. On those days, immerse yourself in his word. Read, study, pray, and then just keep repeating it. Read, study, pray. Read, study, pray. See, the word of God is light, and darkness cannot exist where there is light. And then Paul ends with this, this wonderful list, these clothing requirements, if you will, for Christians, and he just tells us to pray. In, in verse 18, he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Our, our entire armor needs to be covered in prayer. We must first, though, fight on our knees. Sometimes we don't think about that, fighting on our knees. You know, there's just something powerful about getting on our knees to pray to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And when we do that, know this, that the one who has already won the war is with us in battle. Christ has already won the war, and, and, and he's with us in battle. The war has been won, but the daily battle still needs to be fought. So my friends, armor up. Armor up. And put on the full armor. Don't just do one or two of them. You, can't go in, you just can't go into your closet and, and, and just choose one item or two items to wear on any given day. See, if we fail to wear it, 
sin and despair will pierce our flimsy armor and we will be seduced by the destructive powers of the world. We must wrap around our waist the belt of truth. We must strap over our torso the breastplate of righteousness. We must tie on the shoes of of the gospel of peace. We must maintain a solid grasp of the shield of faith and we must pull on the helmet of salvation. And then we must have buckled to our side the sword of God's word. Clothed in the armor of God, we cannot be defeated. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, we do give thanks for this day and we do give thanks for the Apostle Paul and for once again his words to us this morning. We pray that we will armor up as we go on into the world. Whatever, whatever season of life we are in, whatever we are facing, may we use this armor to help us through. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our closing song, okay, I gave you a little bit more hay than I intended. Sorry about that. Uh, but our closing song is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. If you're able, please stand. up and praise and glory to God to go in peace and to love and serve the Lord and may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the power and blessing of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always amen Amen.